My sons, my daughters, how are you? I hope you're well. I hope you're well. Anthony Fantano here, internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for yet another review of an older album for Classics Week. Miles Davis, Bitches Brew. Miles Davis, trumpeteer, band leader, composer, and one of the most versatile musicians in jazz. Really since Miles Davis started putting out solo albums, it seemed that no matter what new idea or musical concept was coming up in jazz, he was there to either spearhead it or just wholeheartedly embrace it with a top-notch album. That rang true of Bop, of Cool, also his modal masterpiece, Kind of Blue, and later in the late 60s and early 70s when avant-garde jazz and fusions of jazz and rock music seemed to be the next new hot thing, he, he was there innovating. And while this LP is maybe not my favorite of his fusion pieces and, and definitely not the easiest to listen to, there are moments where it does get pretty damn impenetrable. I, in a way, sort of prefer in a silent way for, for a shorter, easier listen. The grooves are a bit clearer, the ambient-esque interludes on this album are gorgeous, and it all seems to be a little bit more <laughs> composed. Later, after Bitches Brew, Miles would fly in the face of funk and, and Afrobeat with albums like On the Corner and the extremely fiery and kind of psychedelic Agarta. But Bitches Brew's undying popularity does kind of make it Miles definitive fusion piece, and it's really no wonder why. I definitely think the strong rock influence on this LP does make it sort of an easy transition for rock music fans. This album also, for its time, had a very ear-catching name, as well as an illustrious album cover, plus the extremely lengthy list of guest musicians and a very long runtime does make this album pretty much Miles' most ambitious foray into this style of music. Every track on this LP is a pan panoramic display of these very loose, fluid jams that are very instrument and improv heavy. This album is actually pretty post-production intensive for a jazz LP. There are a lot of in-song edits as well as echoes, reverbs, tape delays. The sounds on this LP are so clear and sharp and vivid. Throw this on some headphones and it's actually like sitting there in the middle of the studio session. There are instruments all over the place. There are at least two drummers on every single track. Typically, one mix all the way in the left channel and another mixed all the way in the right. And the same goes for electric piano players, too. The tracks Pharaoh's Dance and Spanish Key feature three electric piano players each. Now, as far as some of my favorite and most notable players on this LP, for one, there is John McLaughlin, guitar player, and Billy Cobham, both, who made fantastic music in the infamous Maha Vishnu Orchestra. Jack DeJanet also brings drums. Chick Corea plays some fantastic electric piano all over this thing. Wayne Shorter, soprano sax. Joe Zawinul, electric piano. And each of them contribute some writing to this LP as well. And there are many, many other players outside of these guys on this LP too. Just a lot of great jazz fusion giants on this album that either had their own solo albums or projects out there. A lot of them on the very jazz fusion friendly label ECM Records. And another thing that kind of steps this album outside of the traditional jazz realm, for the most part, it is electric and just rock instrumentation on this thing. The only obvious exceptions being Miles Davis and Wayne Shorter, but of course Benny Malpin is on a ton of tracks here playing his very prevalent bass clarinet. It does feel kind of weird having a woodwind in the midst of all of these guitars and, and drum sets on this LP, but it actually adds a pretty interesting texture on a lot of these songs. I mean, with the production, the players, the instrumentation, and the song lengths, Bitches Brew can pretty much be summed up in one single word, and that is excess. And I wouldn't even say it's like well-groomed excess. On a lot of songs here, Miles is completely happy to sort of lay a tempo or a groove or a mood or a key out there and just kind of let the jam progress naturally beyond that quietly urging certain band members to improvise at certain times. There is definitely not a <laughs> 
tight, snazzy, swinging feel to this LP, which usually gets associated with the word jazz. It just goes to show how much of a jazz purist Miles Davis was not. If anything, he was, in fact, just an improvisation purist. And while Bitches Brew was not exactly pushing the avant-garde jazz or the improv envelope as hard as some other LPs that came out around this time did, or even some LPs that preceded this album, Bitches Brew was certainly one of the best full lengths when it comes to improv of this shade. Something that is performed with a large band, very lengthy, and rock influenced. There are parts of these tracks that do feel very clearly composed, whether they be introductions or themes or just sort of syncopated riffs, something like that that brings a song from one area to another. For example, the very kind of refined and, and slow buildup of instrumentation on this album's title track, as well as Miles' bright and echoed shots of trumpet. Once this passes, some bass guitar and bass clarinet comes through, starts playing some lines, and the song goes into its next phase, a very dark, moody, and funky groove. But it's not like a, a good time funky groove. I mean, it's just got this very sour quality to it. It has this heavy sense of uncertainty. Everybody's trying to make note of what everyone else is doing, but also be heard and, and add something worthwhile. It's this tension that kind of makes the songs on this LP sound a, a certain way. This song and many others on here just bring the just awesome electricity of improvisational chants. It's like, what's gonna happen next? Wow, they are really riding this groove so hard. It's getting more tense, it's getting less tense. You don't really get these very clear posts moving any of these tracks from point A to point B to point C. When the songs on here shift, it's it's a very kind of subtle or gradual shift. The music doesn't just kind of break into a catchy melody or anything like that. It doesn't bring the tension into a sweet spot so that you can kind of have a break and not think of what's going on. And if the never ending sense of tension for 20, sometimes almost 30 minutes makes you uncomfortable and totally turns you off to the idea of listening to a record, then that's fine, maybe this LP isn't for you. But regardless of how planned out this album is or isn't, I will say that you're basically hearing on this album, track for track, some fantastic performances from some of the best players in this style around this time. Now, as far as other notable moments outside of the jams, easily the introduction to the song Pharaoh's Dance. That bass line right at the beginning is unmistakable, and the droplets of electric piano slowly falling onto that track are just gorgeous. It's such, again, a very vivid, cinematic song. If the first two tracks, the longest two tracks on this LP, are maybe a little too dismal, a little too long-winded for you, or uneventful, then definitely try out the song Spanish Key. Really one of the more hard-grooving tracks on this album, and on this track, you really do feel those double drum sets as the band is hitting some really fast tempos as they boil over with energy. Plus, there's a spot in the song where John McLaughlin and, and Chick Corea are dueling in each channel, guitar and electric piano. It's fantastic hearing them just bounce leads and melodies off of one another. After that, Wayne Shorter has a huge solo piece in the middle of this song, and his playing is fantastic, especially when he hits those high notes and lets them ring out and the way he moves and shifts in intensity as the band gets louder or gets softer underneath him is just really impressive. Around 8.45 on the song, this riff sort of pops in that changes the song into another gear or just sort of a, a revamped groove. That's not the only time this occurs in that track, but it's really one of the most clear sort of shifts from one moment in a song to another on this entire LP. Like I said, there are changes and there are posts on this album, it's just that they're usually pretty subtle and sort of slow arriving. Really the meat and potatoes and what makes this album so attractive are the jams. John McLaughlin kills it on the track that he's attached to. Miles Davis Runs the Voodoo Down is another hard grooving song if you've loved Spanish Key. And what was once the closer on here, Sanctuary, before a lot of modern reissues of this LP added another song toward the end of this album, which is also awesome, but still back to Sanctuary. I love the skittering drums on that 
that track. And the way the slow moving and echoed horns kind of interact with the drum sets on the track, it's just so, so strange. There's not much more that I could say about this LP in terms of describing the tracks. I mean, to go beyond where I am now, I feel like would be insane. I would be describing literal solo moments in the middle of the songs. And the thing is, if, if how I've described this album generally sounds completely like a turnoff to you, then chances are you don't care what the solos sound like. If you're looking to get into jazz music, there are more accessible and more traditional albums that you could listen to. A lot of them made by Miles Davis. But if you want to listen to some really strong, unique, improvisational music with some potent moods, some very clear, vivid instrumentation just piled in layers upon layers upon layers that you can really get lost in for hours and hours at a time, then give this a try. Miles Davis, Bitches Brew, if you've given this a listen, what did you think about it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Why? Is this one of your favorite albums of all time? If so, why? Why not? Uh, let me know. Uh, Anthony Fantano, Bitches Brew, forever.